How you doing, Michael? Very well, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Now, Michael is an author, researcher, and revealer of ancient esoteric knowledge. After spending 17 years as a police officer, Michael now uses his skills of evidence gathering to decode many ancient codes embedded in the world around us. And we're going to be talking predominantly about Michael's book, The Secret of Christ. So, Michael, this book I read, and you know, I actually found you through another podcast with a, a chap that's doing some really good work as well, um, sort of deciphering and decoding the world around us. So um, that's what led me on to you. Um, but would you like to take the floor here, Michael? Please let me know uh, the secret of Christ. What does it mean? Metaphorical, allegorical, literal. Um, please take it away, my friend. <laughs> well, of course, as you would expect, it's quite a vast subject. Uh, when I've looked at all these different different things uh, initially individually, so I take Christianity, I take other religions, I take Egypt, I take Babylon, I take Samaria, I take the Greeks, I take the, the the Church of Rome, etc. And and initially you believe that they were all separate entities doing their own certain things, leaving their own fingerprints on on history. But what I soon found out is that all of these things are connected. They're connected by theme, and by that I mean esoteric knowledge that has been left for us to decipher in cryptic ways, but also by mathematics. So what I found is that the likes of Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid were given their exact locations through mathematics, their precise location on Earth, but they were also telling you how to find other monuments beyond Earth, such as Mars. When you look at the some of the monuments on Mars, like the face on Mars and the Sidonian city, within the longitude and latitude coordinates, the grids of mathematics, they were telling you how to find Stonehenge, the Great Pyramid, and so on and so on from the face of Mars. So there, there's this massive mathematical matrix and also coded esoteric matrix. Now, when you look at the world of religion and Christ, you have to look at Giza and Egypt, because the original Bible is the oracle in stone, which is the Giza platter. So everything that you can attribute to the story of Christ, to many biblical stories, like Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark, for argument's sake, is the Great Pyramid. So everything that you see in modern day Christianity, you find, first of all, in the Giza plateau in stone. But the Egyptians knew more than the Christian imitators ever did. So who was Christ? Christ is a metaphor for an initiated soul, for a divine mind, for, some, for people who know the truth and reveal the truth. So that is really the Christ. And if you want to know what Christ looks like on earth, it is the coming Messiah. And how do you, you do that? Because you look at the, 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 the Great Pyramid, how the nine pyramids represent the nine months of gestation in three trimesters of three months. So you have the three pyramids, six pyramids, nine pyramids, and the main three represent the final trimester of the nine months of gestation when medical science tells us that consciousness comes into the child. So they are the, 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 the three major pyramids represent the last trimester of, of birth. Now what they are symbolizing is the rebirth of self. So people come through the silver gate, which is just above the hand of Orion. That is why Orion and Orion's belt is so pinnacle in, in, in ancient times. But you come through the silver gate and even the, the, the obelisks at the Vatican and Jerusalem that are aligned to this silver gate of Orion. So you come through that silver gate, you come through the symbolic nine months of gestation through the nine pyramids, and you come out of the Sphinx, which is really the Yoni, it is, it is the Holy Grail. Now, in order for us to come into this third dimensional world, from the celestial to the terrestrial, we have to come through the birth canal, the Graal, the vessel of God, which is the Holy Grail, which is the Yoni, which is represented by the Sphinx of Egypt, which is the lioness that fiercely protects her young. Now, when you look at what is a name for a young lion, it is Judah. So there we have, through the tribe of Judah, through the Sphinx, we have the birth of Christ, because we are told that Christ comes through, comes out of the tribe of Judah. Now, there's other pinnacle areas as well. 
in relation to the birth. Now, a lot of people, including uh, a great researcher, Graham Hancock, doesn't know what the, the Great Pyramid faces north, so I'm now going to tell you. The Great Pyramid faces north because it has every, everything to do with the north wind. Now, when the north wind, which is a celestial force, meets the force of Earth, which comes through the feet, they meet in the middle and it circulates around the navel. So the, the entrance to the Great Pyramid represents the navel facing north. So you have this, this navel, which is obviously the sustenance of a child, hence the nine months of gestation. So the, the navel, the umbilical cord, is the sustenance between mother and child. Now, when you see the likes of the, of, of the Queen's Chamber, and mysteriously you see the shaft of the Queen's Chamber that has been blocked off by a big stone, well, that represents the severing of the umbilical cord between mother and child. So when this separation occurs, the child then has to get its sustenance from other, from other means. And one of those means is by air. So when you see the likes of ancient mummies with their mouth open, they've gone through what is known as the opening of the mouth ceremony, which is a ceremonial ritual of the severing of the umbilical cord. So they ceremonially cut the umbilical cord, which is the harmony of the mouth ceremony, which represents the, the separation between mother and child through the umbilical cord. There's, there's all of this birth and rebirth in relation to, 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 the, to, to the pyramids, which relate to Christ and Judah. And it's really miraculous how what we believe to be a Christ story was, of course, had many, many different... Uh, versions of that before we even get to Christ. You know, you had Horus and, and Isis and all of these different things. So, so the Christ story was never new. But in essence, the Great Pyramid is the Christ. It represents the divine mind. When you put a map of the human head over the Great Pyramid, which I've done, you will see that these chambers marry up to the endocrine system of the human mind. Now, endocrine means secretion within, and it is the pineal gland secretion which is white and yellow, which is the land of milk and honey, the promised land, the land of enlightenment. So now this, so you have the, the likes of the Queen's Chamber, which relates to the pit, uh, pituitary gland, and you have the King's Chamber, which relates to the pineal gland. Now, when you look at the, the likes of the descending and ascending shafts inside the pyramid, that represents the two advents, which is the, descent, the descending of Christ coming down and the ascension of Christ where the Grand Gallery goes down and then goes up. That is the two advents of Christ, the Ascension. So we have all of these different things. And, and of course, when you start then start looking at the Ark of the Covenant, in the Bible, the, the measurements of the Ark of the Covenant match exactly the volume of the sarcophagus inside the King's Chamber. So the Ark of the Covenant is the sarcophagus. And... When initiates went through a molecular change as part of their rituals, as part of their initiation, they were able to take on board a higher voltage. So only those who'd been initiated and chosen could get anywhere near the Ark of the Covenant, which was a crystalline sort of receiver of electrical energy. And it's just magnificent. All of these different things, Noah's Ark uh, is the Great Pyramid. And you have a, a lot of correlation between Giza, the Bible, these characters now when you have these descending shafts they are known as the christ angle so the christ angle is 26.3 degrees from the great pyramid northeast goes straight through bethlehem so really the story of christ and, and the initiations of christ is within the great pyramid of giza so this this sacred knowledge was taken by the hebrews by the kabbalah by the hebrews and taken in and, and made into a biblical story. Now, the Bible and other sacred books were written as such through symbolic code, through metaphors, because that is how you are able to control the depth at which the initiate or the receiver would receive that sacred knowledge. If they weren't ready for it, they wouldn't be able to absorb it. So there's multiple layers of, of sacred books that take you through the different levels of understanding of the sacred knowledge. And that really brought me on to the rest of the ancient world, 
where everything can be thrown into the same mix, where you can look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I've done. You can, the, the, the part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Cumberland Cave Scrolls, the Knights Templar took from the Holy Lands, uh, took from Jerusalem, and they hid that at Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Now, what I've done is I've taken a plan of Scotland. When you put the Star of David over the plan of Scotland, you can see where Roslyn is marked on the map. You then take that Star of David of Scotland and you put it on the floor plan of Roslyn Chapel and it marks the exact spot where the Knights Temple have hidden the Dead Sea Scrolls that contain sacred information which would bring down the church because the, the, the startling thing that is not mentioned anywhere in the Dead Sea Scrolls written by Jewish mystics, knowledge taken from Egypt and hidden from the Church of Rome, there's one person who is completely omitted, not even the, in the acknowledgements, not anywhere in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were written at the time of Christ by Jewish mystics, Christ obviously the King of the Jews, who is not mentioned in them, Christ, not once. Really? Not once. So therefore, the whole foundation of the church has the Christ and the resurrection story. We've got the Christ and the resurrection story that he is now church. So you can see why the likes of the Knights Templar were largely massacred because they were able to blackmail the Church of Rome with this information. Now, when you look at the likes of the Shroud of Turin, the face on the Shroud of Turin is most likely Jacques de Molay, who was a Grand Master of the Knights Templar, who refused to accept the, the crucifixion of Christ. So he was tortured in the same manner as the Bible said that Christ was. And the Shroud of Turin has been, has been dated and it matched exactly the documented recorded time of his death through carbon dating through historical records. Now, when you look at the, the features of Jacques de Molay, they are pretty much the, the, the exact same as the Shroud of Turin. Now, nobody knows what Christ looks like because no one has ever described what Christ is or what he looked like. That's because he never existed as a man. But what the Christ really means is far greater than a single man. It is the Christ potential, the divine knowledge, the initiated soul within each and every one of us that has the Christ potential through initiations, through the way in which they conduct their life, the way in which their life sort of plans out. You can see that a lot of it mimics and mirrors the ceremonies of initiation, which is what is happening in, in my case. So for argument's sake, you know, when you have the crucifixion, the crucifixion just means the removal or the surrender of earthly objects. Now, when you start looking at the names of all of these gods like Yahweh, like Jehovah, that is really magic formula codes. And none of the, these gods are not real. They are magic codes, magic formulas. Now, when you start getting letters and sentences in, in, in particular orders, you then begin to manifest in the three kingdoms which is the astral, the physical, and the mental realms. So for argument's sake, the word God, well, G is water, O is earth, D is, uh, sorry, fire. So you have three elements, and of course, God created with the breath of life. So the breath is the air, which gives you the fourth element. So the word God is talking about the element. And when you start bringing in sacred geometry, like the pentagram, the pentagram is the the star of Bethlehem for one, but the pentagram is the symbol of the mystery schools. And that represents domination of the four elements because you have the fifth element, which is the ether, which is pointing up. So where you have God, where you have Yahweh, where you have Jehovah, they are the four elements. So is the word fiat, as in the car company. That is the four elements. And it is telling you that the divine plan, the pentagram, is to dominate and overcome the four elements which are within us. So how do you dominate the four elements? By controlling emotions, by not becoming angry, which controls fire, not becoming too emotional, which controls tears, by thoughts, which is air, and by controlling the body, which is earth. If you can control those four elements, 
you become the pentagram, you become the divine plan, you become the microcosm of man who has overcome the four elements. So a lot of these sacred geometries and a lot of these sacred codes and God names, etc., are telling us how to overcome the four elements, which was the divine plan of microcosmic man. And we have all of these different things with the Christ, with the Mary Magdalene, which is the Vesica Pisces, which is the Yoni. And you have the number 153, which relates all the way through Egypt, all the way through the Bible, all the way to, to Christ catching 153 fish, etc., etc. It's the world of symbols. It's the world, the, the world of codes. And it is those symbols and codes that are where the real teachings belong. Fantastic. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of information there. And it's quite, it's quite mind-blowing, actually, as well, when you take it all in. What was the purpose of laying out those buildings in this specific way? Was it, and, and who did it? And, and what was the reason for it? Was it a, a, a supernatural intervention that placed these buildings there for us to, as symbols for us to awaken ourselves? Or was it a certain um, human's purpose to do it, a, a, a tribe, a, a collective, a, you know, a community to, to place these there? as a kind of an instruction from the divine for us to learn from. How did they get there? What was the, what was the first stages? How did, how did that all, all that come about? I know it's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, well let's, let's, let's try and chip away at uh, the, yeah. the, the long question. The, the, the Great Pyramid is, is really the epicenter. Right. And you have all of the other monuments around the world that are connected by energies, by, by different things. When you look at, again, when you look at the, the Great Pyramid especially, but the Giza Plateau being the original Bible in stone, when you look at the advanced mathematical genius that is within the Great Pyramid, when you look at the advanced genius that is in the Bible, which is really a universal code book, and it is only now with, with, with using advanced computers are we able to decipher some of the, the codes that are in the Bible? So you then take that to a larger scale and you start looking at what is God. God is an ultimate computer that deals in binary code. Everything in the universe has a mathematical sequence that it will adhere to no matter what, whether that be the golden ratio, pi, whatever it is, it will follow a mathematical sequence depending upon the dimension that it's in. So our third dimension follows third dimensional principles, third dimensional laws, and so on, and so on. So it stands to reason that if you can only decipher these things by computers, then it is an advanced computer, which is the creator that has put them there. So why, why would this advanced computer put this knowledge in stone, in Bible, in whatever, to give us a helping hand because clearly humanity is well behind where it should be. Humanity is in a completely different timeline to where it should be. Humanity is still worshipping gods that don't exist. And we're still worshipping the same rituals thousands of years since their origin. And we're still worshipping them and, and taking part in these public rituals in the exact same way as they did thousands of years ago. We seem not to have ad advanced very much in terms of mentally or spiritually. Okay, we have technological advances or what we think are technological advantage, but compared to what they had thousands and thousands of years ago, we are not that advanced in any way at all. So if you are this being that wanted to give a helping hand to a, a little duckling that's getting further and further and further away from, from its mom, then you are gonna put certain breadcrumbs as a guidance back. You are going to put certain bits of information that when you reach a certain level of maturity, you are going to be able to work it out. Now, when you look at the star codes that were taken from Egypt by the Jewish mystics that were encrypted within the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can actually date the Great Pyramid on the basis of those star codes. And I've dated it to nearly 74,000 years of age based on the star codes that are hidden in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have lots and lots of celestial narrative, lots and lots of things that, that are happening where, where the creator speaks to us without voice. And, you know, you have lots and lots of information in sun rays and, and, and different things that connect to genetics that give us all this information. So in essence, 
we are being given a, a pointer, a compass to get back to where we should be. And all of this gigantic matrix that goes, goes beyond Earth as well, mm. it goes into Venus, Mars, Saturn, the moon, some of the moons of Mars, where you have all of these different monuments that, that mimic an exact replica of the monuments on Earth, and they all tell you how to find each other. So basically, who built the, the, the Great Pyramid? Who built the pyramids? The universal mathematical supreme mind that created everything. Oh, it placed them there. There was no, they weren't built by through um, communication with <coughs> humans as the kind of the relaying information of how to build them. They, they were given the appearance of being built. Mm. But when you start looking at sound, and of course sound again is, is extremely important in terms of these, these monuments because within the Great Pyramid, you know, each of the stones is a different acoustic, a different note. Mm. Now, when I was doing a, a mathematical formula for the speed of reality, there was a large number that kept appearing in my, in my mathematical formula. Mm. It wasn't until weeks later when I was looking at the sonics of the Great Pyramid, did I find the exact same number inside the chords and the notes of the Great Pyramid as it was in my mathematical formula for the speed of reality, and it was completely independent of each other. So sound is important because the, uh, the, the Giza Plateau sits upon the 64 keys of Enoch, which are 64 harmonic keys, which open stargates. Stonehenge is a stargate, and, and people have disappeared from the centre of Star, uh, Stonehenge, never to be seen again. When I, would, when I took a, a group into the centre of Stonehenge, my co-host didn't realise... She, she didn't have any pre-warning of this, but she just walked straight into the centre of Stonehenge and began to do what is known as tonal rules, which is basically different tones of the voice. And she made the ring of Stonehenge vibrate and sing back to us. Now, this is an amateur. You know, no offence, but this is an amateur. When you start looking at the, the masters of sound that these ancients were, they were opening stargates by, by sound and you know the 64 keys of Enoch when you hit the 64th note the hemi demi semi quaver at the right pitch at the right tone you are opening the stargate of the Giza Plateau and that is the 64 keys of Enoch when you look at the the key of Solomon when you look at the key of David the harmonic keys when you look at the word universe it means one verse mm. a verse is a metrical rhythm so that brings mathematics and sound together when you look at crop circles or snowflakes or Nazca lines. That is purely a picture that represents the sound of the environment. Now, when you take, for argument's sake, sound that has been recorded from the rings of Saturn, and you take sound from the inside of crop circles, they are an exact pitch for pitch match. Mm. So there are, the, the rings of Saturn are being used as, as guitar strings and they are transmitting within a hour and a half messages within sound and Stonehenge, which is a crystalline aerial, which is aligned to Saturn in the planetsphere, is taking that and it is creating a picture that represents that sound. And that is why the majority of crop circles are around Stonehenge. There are, there are expressions of sound vibrations. Yes. Wow. Certain frequencies create certain pictures, certain images. And that is exactly what crop circles are. And you can, mm. somebody, somebody said to, to, to me once, uh, I created this crop circle. They, they showed me a picture of it and said, mm. I created this crop circle. And I said to them, how did you encrypt diatonic ratios? And they couldn't answer me because they didn't do it. Yeah. Now, diatonic ratios are basically non-natural sound frequencies that are found in crop circles. Now, when you take, when you take a sort of audio, advanced audio equipment, and you take away the sound from the crop circles and you mimic that on the machine, it's the same picture as a crop circle. So the picture is sound. Wow. And it is, it is certain sounds that are creating certain pictures. When you see a beautiful geometry of a snowflake, that is the sound of the environment that is frozen. You know, the Greeks called uh, geometry frozen music. Could it, could it be then that the pyramids were built with sound vibration as well then? 
Yeah, when you do sound experiments mm. at 432 hertz, it gives you the shape of the tetrahedron, right. which is the pyramid. Mm. Uh, 432 hertz is the golden ratio. And there's, there's a lot of comparison between 432 hertz and the Great Pyramid. And ironically, going back to the gestation, going back to the, the, the birth, mm. representing the birth and coming out into the third dimensional matrix, a baby's cry as it comes out of the womb is at a pitch of 432 hertz. Mm. So it, it all corresponds to sound, to mathematics, to the brilliance of giving us a helping hand. Isn't the tetrahedron also connected to the, to the heart <coughs> chakra? And uh, they use it in like Merkaba meditations and stuff. Is that anything to, is that all connected or, not, or am I off the wrong part? Well, well, <laughs> the, 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 the Merkaba, as in the, the vision of Ezekiel, yeah. is really a vessel to the higher dimensions. The chariot. And that, yeah. that, the chariot. And, and, and that gives you also... You know, the, the Star of David, the Double Pyramid, different things. Now, you, you, you get lots and lots of, as above, so below, you know, with, with the earth being a mirror of the heavens. And that's why, you know, the, 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 the River Nile is the Milky Way. The, the three major pyramids are aligned to Orion's belt. The six little queen's pyramids are also aligned to Orion's belt, but at different times. So it's all sort of star maps. It's all pointing back. All of these ancient monuments point to the sky. And there's, there's reasons for that because we come from the sky. You know, our DNA was encoded elsewhere. Our body comes from explosions from the Orion Nebula. It, so <clears throat> we're from the stars. It sounds to me as though our reality is fractal. So it's like as above, so below. What we're seeing on, on Earth is also occurring, you know, in, in outer space. But also, would you say that it's also occurring within our own human body simultaneously? So you have the, the body the earth body and the universal body, if you want to call it that. Everything is, it's like a microcosm of the macrocosm. Is that kind of how you... It is. That, that's exactly why the, the pentagram hmm. is the symbol of microcosmic man. Because the ether, the, the, the macrocosm, operates in the exact same way as, as we do. So we are a miniature version of what's happening out there. So everything that happens out there happens in air. So we have the same particles, the same atoms, the same subatomic particles, the same things that are happening within us, you know, the law of circulation and, and yeah. all of these different things, everything that happens within the body happens in the universe, happens in the solar system, happens in the Milky Way, in the cosmos. And that is why, you know, when, when we overcome the four elements, which is basically from, through which everything is created, we then start getting back to the macrocosm because we, we've, we've left the smaller pocket of, of the universe and when you start looking at the subatomic particles that, that can exist in states of superposition which is multiple states at once we as humans only ever see one probable outcome of many states i can look at a tree and i can see the wood i can see the bark i can see the leaves but what i can't see is the interference patterns that are colliding to create that shape in my reality. So if you imagine now that you, you, hold, you hold a dice in your hand, at that moment in time, there are six probable outcomes, one to six. You roll that dice, and for argument's sake, number four appears. Then number four is now manifest. All the rest are probable outcomes again. So we only ever see, as humans, one probable outcome of many probable outcomes. And when the very reason that we are able to interact now and have this conversation now and the, and the viewers and the listeners are able to interact with this is because their subatomic particles have chosen to be in this moment in time now. That moment in time just means a particular area in space. They have chosen to be here in this form so that we can interact. So when they say you've chosen to be here now, you have Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's full on, isn't it? And also I was going to say, because of the microcosm and the, and the macrocosm, is that also why you refer to Christ being the consciousness, the great mind, but also the sun as well? The sun in the sky. Yeah. The, the, the sun in the sky is really, it wasn't sun worship. They, they weren't worshiping the sun in the sky. What they were worshiping was the solar logos, which is the celestial force of light. Mm. And the sun is a personification of the solar logos. So you have light, which enables us to see. So light 
which travels in a straight line unless there's a force that, that bends it or twists it. But light is natural. Travel is in a straight line. So for argument's sake, point A to point B can be the question and the answer, the seeker and the sort, but it's also the path of least resistance. And that is why the pyramids have straight lines going up to the apex, because it is a straight line, which is what light travels, but it, because it travels in straight line, it is, it is associated with the truth. So when you come across the saying, you know, I can never get a straight answer, that is why, because light travels in a straight line and light is synonymous with truth because we can see it, we are seers. So the, the, the truth is what the divine mind, the internal Christ seeks. It seeks the truth. And when you go through certain initiations, like the story of Christ really is, whether it's baptism, which simply means initiation, whether it's on the cross, whether it's carrying the cross, whether it's rising from the tomb, it is dealing with different stages of initiation of secret societies. And that is what the Christ life was. But when you activate the Christ within the divine fire, the burning bush of the Moses story, you know, you, you are activate, activating the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the Christ mind within you. And that is what it represents. Now, the, the whole of the story, Noah, Noah represents the seven chakras. And when you look at the story of Moses and you have the parting of the Red Sea from taking the Israelites from captivity to the promised land, well, the captivity is the lower chakra, the root chakra which in, in the Kabbalah, in the Seraphot, the tree of life of the Kabbalah represents Egypt. So Egypt was captivity. Now the promised land is the land promised, which is the enlightenment, enlightened state. So when you look at the parting of the Red Sea, in Gnostic circles, in, in secret society circles, that is known as the open sea. That is the path of least resistance from the root chakra to the crown. So you are taking the path of least resistance from your captivity to your promised land, your enlightened state. And that is what the Moses story relates to. You know, the burning bush is the fire of the, of the pineal gland, which is awakened to the Christ of truth and so on and so on. And, and there are some, each, each of the scriptures, each of the, the monuments is a, just a different way of saying the same thing. Where does the, the sun come into it though? We kind of touched on it there though. Is, is it not also true that um, uh, Jesus is also, um, an expression of the sun in the sky and um you talk about in the book the um you know because it's the light it's the savior but we just refer to it as s-u-m but it's actually s-o-n and when the sun like goes through the sky through the 12 well goes through the 12 uh, zodiac signs that's what's referred to in the bible as the 12 apostles is that not is this all part of it as well it is because you have certainly in in, in the heavens you you have the, the movement of the sun, the Christ, through the 12 cosmic initiators, which are the 12 disciples, the 12 signs of the Zodiac. Now, each of those 12 signs has a different trait, has a different personality, has a different influence on the body that relates to those constellations, those stars. Now, so when you look at the Zodiac, you're not just looking at the, the, the stars. You're looking at each of them having 30, degree, 30 degrees of sky. So it is really a, a, a sort of a, a cosmic thing. So when you start looking at the heavenly Christ, which is the sun, the solar sun, the son of God, the, the divine Christ is the sun, but the fallen Christ in the stars, in the, in the sky is Jupiter. Now you had two gods in the ancient past and one of them was Zeus that was related to Jupiter. So you have a Jesus, which gives you Jesus. Now Jupiter is, is, is knowledge, it is fairness, it is justice, it is judgment, and it is the father of the sky. So when you start looking at the heavenly Christ, which which is represented by the sun, because it is the light, it is the it is the burning, you know, son of God, then the certain things, certain in, in, in the Giza Plateau, in, in the layout of the Sphinx and, and, the, and the pyramids, that tell you the real birth date of the biblical son, the biblical Christ. And it is the 11th of September, 9-11, which ironically uh, relates to other things as well by no coincidence. So when you look at the Bible and it says, a woman appeared in the sky, clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet, that is Virgo the Virgin with the sun in her abdomen, 
coming up above the horizon on the 11th of September. Now the whole 25, 25th of December scenario is Sol Invictus, a Roman cult. But what they wanted to do was to get Christians to worship their cults under a different guise. So they had the birth of Christ on the 25th of December. So when Christians are celebrating Christmas, they are really unknowingly celebrating Sol Invictus, the Roman cult. So the sun does have bearing in this because it is the solar logos, the sun, you know, the, the, the light, and light is truth. Yeah, it's the universal, the cosmic um, expression of our own logos, our own um, internal um, potential, you would say. That's the symbol of it in the skies, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it is a, a personification of the solar logos, which is the celestial force of light. So we, we are all... We all, you know, relate to light. The light gives us the ability to see. Yeah. You know, our skin reflects light. So when you look at David, King David, David relates to the skin. So we, we have the enlightenment, you know, that the sun activates certain things within the, within the skin and within the body. So there's all of these different connections when you look at zodiacal man, you know, for argument's sake, the two feet represented by the two fish of Pisces. You know, the higher mind is Aries. Then you, you then start getting into the Lamb of God and the Lamb's blood on the door, the doorway as the sun goes through the cusp into, into Nissan, into April, which is then the Passover, which is then the Last Supper, which is then the Nissan logo, because Nissan means April. And you get March and April, which is, you know, Mars, Ram, all of these different things. So we have a lot of astronomy involved in this. We have a lot of secret information. The, the biblical prophets or the prophets of the ancient past were astronomers and astrologers because science is really observation and measurement. Now, the first bodies ever to be measured or observed by man were the stars. So the ancient prophets were celestial narrative readers. They knew with precise accuracy what was going to happen at certain times of the year or certain times of the zodiacal year, certain times of the procession of the equinox, because they had witnessed it previously. They could say with, with certainty, the next age of Aquarius will be the same as the last one. And this is what happened on the last one. Therefore, this is what will happen again. So they weren't necessarily prophets. They were readers of the stars. And that's where we're at, at the moment, isn't it? I mean, um, what, how do you see things going at the moment? Because it almost feels as though there's what's happening in society right now is almost the referent to the end times in, in the Bible. I don't know if you've got any insights into that, but um, there's certain things that are coming true that's been you know, prophesied. Um, there's certain even things like the mark of the beast 666 we're seeing that now with uh, certain patents that are out there for people to see um, I don't want to go too much into it. I don't want to get this uh, video <laughs> banned or anything but uh, <laughs> do, do, do you see the same thing do you think there's certain things still encrypted and, and um, encoded within the Bible that's referring to today's times yes and the 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 current virus that we face with at the moment was mentioned in the Torah thousands of years ago and not only was it mentioned it also mentions the exact year which was 2020 no. so and this was thousands of years ago in biblical code that's been found by computer can when, when you talk about biblical end times it is not the end of the earth it is the end of an age so when you go through the end of an age and there is a a transfer between the ages depending upon what sign it is depends upon whether that's a smooth transition or not. The current one, Aquarius, is a stubborn, fixed sign. So with that comes a lot of upheaval, comes a lot of chaos, comes a lot of disorder, comes a lot of the collapsing of, of various institutions. But Aquarius comes like a thief in the night, which is what the Bible tells us. So it is not the end of the earth, it is the end of an age. So, you know, you had Moses that, that, that saw in, you know, left for us with the carving of the bull you have christ the goes from aries to pisces we now have pisces to aries so it's the end of an age not the end of the earth i thought we were moving into aquarius from pisces or have i got that wrong no no we, we go from pisces which was the age of christ yeah which was the the age of i believe we're going into aquarius which is the age of i know so there's that transition between the biblical times of belief to the age of Aquarius, which is I know. Now, it is 
the water bearer, but it's really an air sign. But we are actually going into Aquarius. Some people say that we're already in, some people saying that we transitioned into it, but nevertheless, you can start to feel the effects hundreds of years before it happens. So we are going into Aquarius now. So it's, almost, it's actually Pisces that's uh, digging their heels in. It's almost like Pisces doesn't want to give up its grip of the, of the kind of the, um, the epoch that we're in. Is, is that not more correct? And, and, and it's almost like being resistant to allow the, the new epoch to emerge or to kind of, you know, be present. Well, there's, there's resistance from both sides because mm. Pisces doesn't want to give it up. And Aries is a stubborn fixed sign. <clears throat> so it's, it's forcing it through. So in that transition, which is not smooth between those particular signs, we are seeing the collapse of certain things, which is what we, you know, people would say is Armageddon and this, that and the other, but it's not Armageddon, it's simply the end of a cosmological age, which is a natural occurrence. That is the way the big wheel spins. That is the way it was created to, to, to happen because everything is a cycle. Mm. And, you know, so, you, you can get... Mm. What, what, is the, what does it look like, this, this new age then? Is it, is it meant to be a, an age of enlightenment, an age of uh, a golden era? Or is it, is it yeah? It's meant... Well, it, it is. I mean, again, the, the certain words and certain phrases that go with each age, and, and Aquarius is the age of I know. So it brings with it seeker of the truth and sometimes to see through the illusion, sometimes to challenge the illusion. And that is what comes with the age of Aquarius. So that is what we will see. And, you know, certainly pe when you speak at certain religions, they say, well, the golden age is not for another four or 5,000 years yet, but the golden age is within you as well. Mm -hmm. So when you start to have this knowledge, when you start to accept this knowledge, when you start to look and seek to find and you start seeing through the illusion, then within you, there is a golden age because gold is, is the color associated with wisdom. You know, that is why you have Egyptian masks that are covered in gold because it's the skin of the gods. It's enlightenment, the philosopher's stone, you know, the, the gold metal that comes from the lead, the Saturn to the sun in, in astronomy. So gold is, is associated with enlightenment and wisdom. And that is what will come but but the, it's not just the planets because we are the planets we are the universe we are the solar system we are the planets and when we start coming into into this information and this wisdom then it awakens the golden age within each individual and so what's the resistant force here would you say that it's it's a, a, a saturn alien force from saturn which is where we get the word satan from is that part of the resistance for us awakening and if so is that also part of the piscean paradigm that's trying to hold its place or like how does that fit in and what's like the what's the kind of the opposite to that which is like trying to awaken us like what are the two different opposing forces at play do you think the well you have saturn yeah. and you have the higher octave of saturn which is venus so you have satan and lucifer now, when you start looking at the likes of Mother Mary, who is called the Queen of Heaven, Lucifer is also called the Queen of Heaven. Now, when you go to the, the Wailing Wall of Jerusalem, they are mimicking unknowingly copulation, copulation with the Queen of Heaven. So the, the Wailing Wall was actually the ruins of a Roman temple built to worship the goddess Venus. So we have Saturn, Satan, Venus, Lucifer at different octaves. Now, in, in comparison to that, you have the sun and you have Jupiter. So at the moment, you have Saturn and Jupiter in Aquarius. And the, there's always, in, in the universe, there has to be an opposite force. Some people call that duality, but mm -hmm. the way in which our reality works is by the comparisons of duality. So... You know, you can have black, you have white, you can have good, you can have bad, you can have negative, you can have positive, you can have light, you can have dark, you can have day, you can have night. You have to have a duality. So you have to have an equal and opposite force. And that is what we what we have. So you'll have opposing forces going against each other. But nevertheless, it is clockwork. And as it is meant to be, 
it will be. Mm. And despite the resistance, you will have the age of Aquarius. Despite the resistance, you will have everything that was encoded mathematically, cyclically to, to happen and to occur. But it doesn't mean to say that it, 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 it comes easy because there is also opposite and opposing forces. You know, even if you look at Newton's physics of probable outcomes, and if I touch that computer now, the computer also touches me. There has to be an equal and opposite reaction to yeah. everything in our reality. What what is it about Saturn that's emitting this like vibration or sound vibration? It's what it's from my understanding. It almost seems to invert the natural order, and we're almost seeing expressions of that in society where every anything connected to the very fibre, the very fabric of what it means to be a human is almost being inverted. Such as biological sex. There's no such thing as biological sex. Apparently, there's 500 genders. You know, they're trying to corrupt the family and they and you know break family apart. They're trying to um, demonise. Um, just healthy, healthy homes, you know, just healthy societies. They're trying to push all these toxins and all these chemicals at us, which are destroying the air, the water, the food we're eating. You know, even the music that we listen to is just, it's like pushing materialism and, and, and my hose and my money and my, um, you know, like it almost seems it's like, every, is, is this a, a, an expression of that satanic energy from saturn that vibration and, and is, is its role to invert the natural order because that's what it kind of appears to me as when when you look into the ancient past and, and they talk of the afterlife and and uh, mm. the, the passing from this life into the afterlife for me that is the opposite way around for me i think earth is the afterlife i think earth is, is hell now when you look at how the quran describes hell it describes hell as a place where people, despite being shown the obvious truth, can't see it. When you start looking at who is who, who are we told in the Bible is is the ruler of hell, Satan. Now, when you start looking at the people who run in this world, they call themselves the elites. L, elites. L now means Saturn. Does so it? we have. Yeah, originally it was God, Al, El, God, as in self has God within the self. But then it was later it was later changed to mean Saturn. So when you go and vote in an election with a black ballot box, the black cube is Saturn, and obviously election is L, Saturn, election. So when you put in your voting for Boris Johnson or whatever, you are mimicking the planet Saturn that rules this world. So you have. The elites, which means Saturn's chosen, who are running hell. Now, the god of hell is Saturn, and they are creating hell. They are, they are keeping hell. And what they want to do is keep as many souls in hell as they possibly can. So they do that by the things that you just described, to keep us in a low vibrational state, by creating a false light that when people go through the light at the end of the tunnel is a false light to keep us in the, in the birth and death cycle of hell, the cycle of torment. Now, I think that what the ancients were telling us is how to escape the birth and death cycle, how to escape this hell. And that, that to me, is, is the story of the afterlife, but I think people have got it wrong. This is the afterlife, this is hell, and this is what we have to escape from by removing ourselves from the continuous cycle of torment. And how do we do that? Come on, let's, we, need, we, can't, we can't leave that on a cliffhanger. What's the escape well, route here? Well, my, my friend says he's just going rip to rip a hole through the matrix when he dies, that's what he said, and jump out. Well, that may be closer than he thinks, but now there's the certain, the certain things. If we... If we don't embrace this, this ancient knowledge, if we don't seek, if we don't find, if we, if we, have, no, if we have no sort of willingness to, to, to put the work in and, and find out, we are going to be continuously coming back in different guises because we are vibrationally compatible with the planet that we're coming back to. We are, we are the same vibration, the same frequency of, of the planet of birth. Now, I mentioned earlier about dominion over the over the, the four elements. <clears throat> when you control your body, when you control your thoughts, when you control your mind, when you control your environment, when you realize that your words and your thoughts create your reality, in other words, biblically, the word 
made flesh. What you speak, what you think becomes your reality. So you have to be sensible, you have to be mindful, and you have to control those elements. You have to control those parts of you. <clears throat> when you overcome and dominate the four elements, you then become a higher being. When you start to control your mind, your body, your thoughts, your words, and when I say words, words can bring the highest divine knowledge, but they can also kill people. The tongue has no bones, mm. but it can destroy someone. Yeah. Now, when you start looking at the throat, where the words emanate from, what is in the throat, fifth chakra, the Adam's apple. It is the Eden, it is the fall of man, the Adam's apple. So when you start learning these things, when you start mastering yourself, when you start, the, the, the one way in which to end a continuous loop, a continuous circle, is to bring a straight line into it, which is truth. When people start to realize the truth or find the truth, seek the truth, then yes, you are still for now in this reality, you know, that there's nothing, nothing you can do about that. You are for whatever reason you are here, but you can educate the soul. You can initiate the soul. You can raise your vibrations so that you're not touchable by the lower vibrations that are trying to control you and keep you here. Now, I, I always say that when you are in a low vibrational place, which is where they try and keep you by various means, then you are controllable because you are in that arena and they've been doing this for thousands of years. They're quite good at it. Now, the, the, the last place you want to meet a boxer is in the boxing ring because that's his domain. What I tell people is if you raise your vibrations, they can't touch you because it's too high for them to touch you. That is why they have to put all this concerted effort in keeping people there, down, where, where they rule, the kingdom that they rule. Because the, the moment that people start to raise their vibrations and raise their knowledge and see through the illusion, then you escape the illusion. Mm. And that is how you escape what's going on. That if you know The balloon, the natural state of the balloon is to float but they're pulling on the strings to keep us down. Now, the moment they lose that string, we're gone. And you, think that's, just, and you think that's just, be, just by seeing through the illusion, that's, that's your way of vi raising your vibration? That's one way. I mean, seeing through the illusion is sort of an end result of, of, of things that come, you know, so yeah. knowledge, learning the truth, learning what's going on, learners really ruling this world, learn what their ultimate goal is their ultimate plan is learn how they are keeping us down as you say through air every 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 channel that we need to exist they have monopolized air water food all of these things so when you start to realize that and you start to counteract their moves on the chessboard when you start to raise your knowledge when you start to raise your vibrations when you start to master your body when you start to master your mind and you don't get angry you don't get dragged into an extreme polarity because that then the elements of fire is having dominion over you you are not having dominion over the elements of fire or water or air or earth which is the body so by consciously taking control of all of those elements within you become a higher vibrating being. When you become a higher vibrating being, the lower vibrations have no relevance to you. But you're still on earth though, right? You're, you'll still be here. So therefore it won't be hell in your reality. Is that right? But you'll still be, on, in, so still be coexisting with other people who are in hell. You, well, you'll still be coexisting with other people and sometimes you will be entering into their reality because we live in a shared network. Mm. So when you have billions of people thinking about one particular thing, then that becomes the reality of the planet, of, of, of the shared network of conscious thought. But you can either choose to be stuck in the quicksand of that, or you can choose not to be. You can either be extreme polarity, extreme polarity, or you can be non-duality which is the middle ground so you can nip in and nip out but you can rise above it you can look above it mm. and you can stay out of it because if you if you are in it then 
those elements are controlling you. You are not controlling those elements. It's, it's a case of who, who has dominion over what? Does it have dominion over you or do you have dominion over it? Absolutely. You know, even just the stuff that's going on at the moment, it's very easy to like lose, like feel very drained from it and give your energy away to it. But like, I'm trying to like be in it, but not of it. And, you know, sort of navigate through it, but not, not really get drawn into that morphic field or whatever you want to call it. And I've definitely had that in the last few months. I've been very like, you know, just incensed by it, you know, absolutely angry, like just tearing my hair out about it, getting really emotional about it. And I found it's just, it's, it's draining my life energy away from me. Now, now I'm learning how to just be the eye in the storm, if you know what I mean, and try and like, you know, be very Zen about it all. And still like, even though all this nonsense is going on right now, still trying to be very centered. I think that's, that's the kind of the way, the way forward, isn't it? But can I ask you something on that, Michael? These controlling forces, the elites, if we're going to call it that, and if they are like an expression of Saturn, Saturn's ring, Saturn's energy, like where are they emanating from? Are, they, are, are we saying that they, they are an intervention onto the earth and they've, they've created this hell that, that was once a loving place? Or where are these like uh, malevolent forces originating from then? Are they actually within the human psyche or are they actually off-world intervention? What, what has happened is, if you imagine uh, an original grid, mm. which is the correct timeline, the, the, track, the correct stage of development for, for this planet, and then you get this malevolent force that wishes to control it, and it puts its own grid over it. It's almost like mm. when you have the national grid and, and you're putting diverts in there. So, you know, energy is going to the place that you want, you know, it's feeding what you want and, and, and cutting out what you don't. So you have this malevolent force, which some of it is human, some of it is human possessed, some of it is from places, other dimensions, not here, but they wish to control the race that is on this planet mm. and they are doing that. Now, it makes no sense if you turn around and say that, why are humans doing this to humans? Why are humans doing this to a planet, their host planet? Well, it makes more sense if you realize that they're not entirely humans and they wish to control this planet. And all the things that you are seeing is part of that control. I mean, clearly they can't just come in and, and, and invade and take over because they haven't done that. But they can do it through infiltration. They can do it through manipulation. They can do it through deception. They can do it through program of people's minds to, to make the relevant stuff you know seem completely irrelevant to them uh, so that's how they're doing it they're, they're basically they basically put their own grid, grids their own blueprint over an existing blueprint and it is taken us off the timeline it is taken us off the advancement that we should now be in and that is why there is so much monumental or monolithic or the presence of, of, of other beings that are trying to help but of course in, in a universe of duality, in a universe of opposites, you know, you have to have what you deem as negative, you have to have what you deem as positive. There's always two contending forces, but there's always one uniting them, which is the neutral. So if you remain in the neutral, if you remain in the middle ground, you are not in any of the extreme polarities. You are observing, but you're not getting too involved in it. And that is really the place of self-preservation. Gone, gone are the days when I was spending two or three days on Facebook arguing with somebody over a point. I don't do that anymore. You know, I've got a delete button. Yeah. Because who is it really serving? Because while I'm spending two or three days arguing with you, look how many people that want to be helped I can't, I can't speak to or I can't yeah. give my attention to. Yeah. Let them go. If they're not ready, let them go. They will come around at some point. But yes, we, we, we are... We are suffering at the hands of a, of, of a malevolent force at different levels, interdimensional human hosts that are basically controlling the planet and controlling the race that is upon the planet. Yeah, yeah great answer. Is it true that the earth is connected to maybe the heart chakra and that's why it's like earth is heart as an anagram and um, it's re relating to the, uh, the, the, the chakra system as well, like the planets, just quickly to finish on that. Is there anything with the earth being connected to the heart? Yes, because the, the, the heart chakra is actually an electromagnetic pulse. So the heart gives you basically the apple of Eden, which is the torus shape around the body, an electromagnetic shape around the body, which gives you super consciousness. Now, 
the earth is also electromagnetic you know we have the two poles that push together that give us the electromagnetic grid which we can see sometimes with the likes of the northern lights which is really the sun particles reflecting off off, off the atmosphere uh, the electromagnetic grid so the heart is really a smaller earth smaller planet a smaller electromagnetic grid uh, and the heart of course is sacred you know when when the egyptian mummies put their arms like that the, the pivotal point where the two arms connect is over the heart now when you look at the shape of the hands of the elbows and the head that is the shape of the pentagram now the heart is at the center of the pentagram so the heart is 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 extremely important because it's it, it's also your your internal master you know the the voice Mm. Without words, it is the intuition, and it is your gut feeling. It is all the you know. Go with your heart. It is. It speaks. It is a brain in itself. Mm. Along so with it is stomach. connected. Yeah. Along with the stomach. Yeah. The so we, we we have. Yeah. yeah. So we have all of these different things that are connected. You know, we're we're connected to the human residence, the electromagnetic grid. We are electromagnetic grid ourselves. Mm. So in 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 comparable terms, you know, if you just imagine Russian dolls. And, and we're the smallest doll in the middle, but but nevertheless, you know, we're still encased by the rest of uh, of, of the multiple levels of self and beyond self. Powerful. <clears throat> we packed a lot in there in just an hour. I mean, I wish I could have you for longer. I mean, it was it's absolutely fascinating stuff. I mean, it really is. It's just mind blowing. And um, yeah, I just want to I want to take this journey of seeking the truth and uh, keep looking for clues. You know, you're a, you worked in a police force for 17 years. I want to do that same thing. I want to see my life as a as a Sherlock Holmes looking for piece by piece of, you know, a bit of evidence and, you know, and I think that's how we should uh, source our information from. I don't, I think we're coming out of the old way of doing things top down, uh, looking at the box in the corner of the room and getting our information that way. We should all be journalists now. We should all be uh, detectives, I think. And so that is part of finding that, as you would say, that is the, the, the Christ potential, that Christ consciousness, if you want to call it the greater mind. I know some people get a bit put off by some of these seemingly new age terms but it just means that inner fire that inner um sense of creativity and truth and uh purpose isn't it so um i'm going to end off with this michael again thank you so much would you like to navigate people signpost them to your your latest work or the most relevant work for everyone yeah of course my, my latest three books are the ancient code the code of christ and alchemy of the gods and each of those books contain this kind of information. Uh, I am writing two more simultaneously, which will be at a greater level still. But nevertheless, the, the Alchemy of the Gods is, is the last book I, I wrote that contains some of the information that we've, we've spoken about tonight. My website is www.michael-feely.com. And from there, there's lots and lots of different things, Skype calls, uh, newsletters, events pages. I'll be uh, doing conferences in America next month etc so all that will be on on on, on the uh, on the website as well and that takes you to all the different social medias that i'm now involved in all right well thanks a lot for coming on michael i really really appreciate it and thanks to everyone for, for watching this episode if you enjoyed this please remember to hit the like button subscribe and uh you know hit the bell notification as well if you want to see more content like this uh, pop up on your newsfeed because i wouldn't be surprised if this sort of stuff uh it gets shadow banned because you know when you take that straight line path it can often uh, ruffle some feathers, can't it? So, um, you know, please do your best to support this channel, support Michael, and uh, let's all raise the bar together. So from me and Michael, that's it for today, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.